Without a shadow of a doubt. We back at it again. It's it got to be seven o'clock, man. Y'all know what time it is, man. It's the war zone. We one man short, but he coming. Say I got my co-host in the building. Demetri K. And I am the five star general. Say, man. If something got to be in the water in Missouri City, Texas, man. But them boys ain't playing down there on that gridiron, but they ain't playing on that track. Say, man, it's serious down there. I got the baddest track coach in the nation. Lloyd Banks in the building with us tonight on the war zone. Missouri City, Texas, time to stand up. Appreciate that, appreciate that, appreciate that, my love. Appreciate that. Hey man, I want to welcome y'all to the war zone. And uh, as I always say, man, thank you for tuning in. Cause without y'all, we couldn't we couldn't do this. And just to let y'all know, in case y'all think we've been being nice, we've been good all day. We've been raising hell all day. We've been raising hell on different platforms all day. When I get off this one, I got to get on another. One. I'm gonna raise hell all day. Joe Biden is trash, but we'll talk about that later on. Say tonight, man. I got I got the family in the building, man. I got the family in the building, man. Yates alumni, but it ain't about JY. It's about a school that sits in Missouri City, Texas. And it's like they in their own world of me. And I mean, from a community standpoint, from the you know, the way that some people treat them, it's like they in their own world, but that's okay. Because when you're in your own world, you can do some great things. And those kids out there are some great kids, whether it's girls track, boys track, football, the whole nine yards, basketball, everything. Just a bunch of good kids that's stuck in the same building. But they got this track team, man, that when, when I'm looking at these cats, man, I'm just like, all lead boys running a four by one must run a three nine 40 yard dash. <laughs> no, they, I wish. They, they, they that fast, man. So, you know, I called up my man, head coach Lloyd Banks, told him, man, we want to we wanna shine a light on Missouri City, man, and uh, asked him to pop into the war zone. What's going on, coach? Man, I'm good, man. I'm good, man. How you doing, this coach? Everything good? Man, I'm good, man. I'm blessed. Highly favored, man. Just um, happy to you another day, man. Oh, man, I appreciate you stopping by, man. Uh, Man, all I can say, I, I, I've seen people build programs from the ground up and not have a smidget of the success that you guys have had out there, especially on the football field. But more importantly, with this track team and this track team is is nationally known. I mean, you, you can't scream boys track in high school unless you scream in Marshall, Marshall High School. And the good thing is. Is uh, I went out there to help do something, Demetra, and and help the kids on something. And the the actual, I think it was the PTO, yeah, okay. made uh, me an honorary marshal buffalo. So I'm a Yates line, and I'm an honorary marshal buffalo. So, uh, oh yeah. So, coach, you know, give us a little background on 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 your coaching experience and 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 where you come from, bro. Well, first of all, first of all I'm gonna say I'm a uh, I'm always believe kids can go. You know, you know that. I'm um third world kids at heart. You know, Lockhart, Ryan Yate. Um, you know, played ball under uh Coach McGuin, ran track with Coach Bush. Um, love those I love those individuals to death. Um they've sharpened pretty much, you know, as as a coach. I take a lot I take a lot from them. You know, uh, a lot of people like to ask about, hey man, you know, um, you know what y'all got going on over in Missouri City. And I said, Listen, I learned it a long time ago. You know, we're gonna work hard. Period. No substitute too forward. We're gonna work hard. We're gonna have a good time doing it. Um, and um, we're all gonna be on the same page. At the end of the day, I want our kids to be successful and try to put in a position where they can change their zip codes, you know. And I tell everybody, we're gonna see these kids in school. It's cool to be successful, going out winning and all that good stuff. That's a beautiful thing. But if you give me four years, you gotta go to school. You know, I don't care if it's I don't care where it's at. You know, as long as I get these kids uh, kids to school and get the education paid for, I feel like I have done my part. And um and I love it. I love it. I never get tired of it. Never a dull moment with it. Um, 
You know, you, you know, like, like I tell my kids, you give me four years, I'm, I'm gonna give you four. Period. Coach, I mean, and when you say that, a lot of a lot of people, when they think of a student athlete, they they can't brag on that aspect of it. You know, the kid leaving high school, going to college. In the last four years, how many kids have you sent to college, no matter what division? Oh man, uh, um, last four years. Um, matter of fact, it's funny you said it, Mara. I got hold on, I got it in my phone because I had to. I had an interview about that a couple of, couple of weeks back. I'll let me pull it up right now. The last four years. I know it's, a, um, it's football, football and track. What, what, the kids that play football and track and field, we sent 26 kids to school. Wow. 26 student athletes. Yeah. And, and the crazy part, I'm going to tell people, you're not just sending them to any school. I mean, these kids going D1. Yeah. These, uh, these kids are going D1. I know y'all had a, fi- a phenomenal football season. Mm-hmm. Um. You know, did, 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 I mean, Demetri, unless you see this, it'll blow you away. It'll blow you away. And this is my last question. I'm past it, Demetri. Um, how many state championships have y'all won? Um, man, we, um, out of the last five years, we won four state championships the last five years. Uh, we won a 15, 16, and 18, 19. And um, I'm pretty confident that if we had, had an opportunity to run the, to finish this year off, we would have got it this year. The kids were primed and ready. Um, and they were like when I say chomping at the bit to go, they were ready to go. You know, we finished the season, even though it was shortened. We finished the finished season number one in the nation, four by one, uh, number two in the nation in the um, four by two and the four by four. So, um, you know, and we were looking to drop uh, the kids. We were, you know, like I said, they was you know getting healthy, a lot of them, um, and just antsy, just ready to go. We was getting to the uh, the championship portion of the season, the district, and so forth. The song, um. And they were ready. They were ready to rock. You know, they were looking good in practice. Um, and all of them, you know, all, and the funny thing about it, like I tell everybody, I got to turn them down. You know, I actually have to tell the kids, hey, relax. You know, as a coach, that's one of the good things. When you have, when you're in this position, you have to turn kids down and not turn them up. Then um, you sit in a good place. It's a real good place. So, um, you know, I'm proud of their work. I'm proud of the kids that came before them to set the, uh, set the standard. You know, now it's funny. I, I, can't, I can't think the last time – I had to have an, um, a conversation with a kid about effort. I mean, a lot of times, the kid will get them before I get them. If we're on the track and somebody's not doing what they're supposed to do, the old head will get them before I get them. They'll be like, say, fam, we don't talk about effort up here. We're going to have a problem with effort, you can go to the backfield. You know, I don't have to, I don't have to say a word because everybody understands that, you know, the expectations is high. You know, and, and the last and the last thing I want to do is be the group that's known as um, to not finish uh, highly in the state uh, or, or nationally. You know, they, they really, really um, have gravitated towards uh, the standard. And um, as a coach, I can't do number love it. Ms. Demetra. So um, welcome to the war zone once again. So I guess in order to win championships, the, the athletes have to be fast, right? So I read um, a quote of yours, or it was one of your beliefs, and you believe that all students can be taught. Now, do you believe that all athletes can be taught speed or is that something that comes natural to them? You know, it's, well, speed is funny. It's very difficult to make someone fast. That's a very, very, very hard thing to do. And that's why it's such a, um, it puts such a high uh, price on it. Like if you watch, you know, if you listen to any sports, whether it's football, basketball, weather sport, there's always a high pressure on speed. I've always, like, like I tell my linemen during football, if you're a big boy, you can run, you're going to get paid. Period. I don't care what you're doing on God's green earth. If you're in athletics and you fast, they're gonna find something to do with you. Um, some of it is. Some of some kids run out of bed with it. There's some. There's some kids you 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 try your best as a coach not to get in the way. You know, you try not to, you not try not to be too smart and mess them up. And you have some kids that just come along. They're hard workers, and you you develop them and they become great. And I've had a lot of those. But some of the kids, you know, you have some kids that just roll out of that with it. You know, I, I found a, I found a couple of kids just in PE. Just messing around, not knowing that they can run, uh, because you know we're in a great state of Texas, where um, you know football and basketball are king. You know, so a lot of times you have little kids that get caught in those middle sports. They don't really, you know, they don't really know they have that kind of ability. And um, you know, once you get them out there, like I tell the kids all the time, give me a track meet, 
give me a two weeks of practice. If you feel like you don't want this, I'll never bother you again. So a lot of times they get uh, they get enamored with the with the work, and if you have a little success, and they take off. You know, all all you do got to just show them, and sometimes you just show the kids um, a little light, and they'll they'll gravitate to it. Uh, so have you ever had, and I don't know if you answered this before, um, any uh, students or athletes go to the Olympics? Not Olympics, but I did have, because again, this is my, my, this is my 10th year, Marshall. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a kid last year named Amir Ladin who um, ran in the uh, world championships. Um, and I'm very proud of him. Um, he's doing his thing and he was looking forward to this, this Olympic year. No, this is going to be, a, this, this is going to be an Olympic year for him. Uh, but you know, you had COVID, whatever case may be, and um, he got pushed back. So hopefully next year he gets the opportunity. But he's he'll be most definitely in the mix, though. I had a couple of matter of fact, you know, it's funny you say that I have a couple of kids that could have man, but you know, I got some kids that play football. So you know, when they see them dollar sign, you know, it's like eh, I think I'm gonna lean towards football a little bit. So and I can't knock it for it. I totally understand. Like I tell them, my number one priority is just to get you there. You know, whatever you decide to do once you get to college, it's you. And you know, I just want to get you to school. So um, what are your um, athletes doing to stay conditioned um, during this time? Because they can't really, you know, get together due to the social distancing. So are you giving them advice or having them run drills or something to keep you? You know, you know Ms. Kate, honestly, when um, when everything went down, um, our first thought process was, you know, hey, let's just stay in shape. You know, we you know we had no idea for how long this was going to be or any of that. Um, so a lot of my kids, they just took, took it upon themselves um, to put up a, they put a schedule up. You know, they work out Monday, Tuesday, and Thursdays. They get together. Um, and they go to different parks, heels, and so forth and so on, and they get it done. And now they give me a call, let me know what they did today, who's doing what, who didn't show up. And I'm like, they just they just understand that the expectation level, it is what it is. There's no bending in. There's no any of that. We're going to we're gonna work. And they, they love it. And um, they haven't stopped. They have not stopped. They haven't stopped. They haven't stopped since the wall went down. So you know, again, they they you know they get together three days a week and they just go, you know, they haven't stopped and um, they enjoy it. Boys and girls out there, they're running, um, you know, drills the whole nine, they're having a great time together, and uh, they're getting better. Nice. Let me ask you something, Coach. Um, as I know, we had it when you know you you got coached by Coach McGowan, mm -hmm. who was my offensive coordinator. I got coached by Coach Booker. Right. And I want you to explain how important it is to have not just a coaching relationship with your kids, but have a personal relationship yeah. with your kids, especially yeah. kids that come from, quote, unquote, you know, the troubled areas. Yeah. You know, man, I, tell you, I tell everybody, I say, man, you know, it's, man, it's very difficult to ask a kid to give you 100 percent if they don't know you. You can't ask me to run through the wall. You can't ask me to to be out here running these laps and sweating and dying and so forth and so on if me and you don't have some kind of connection. I've always felt well, I don't care what it is. I don't care how small it is, how big it is. Each one of my kids, we have something that we share individually that nobody else has. All my kids. I don't care if it's a rap song. I don't care if it's some kind of food we eat. I don't care if it's some, some, something that we read, a quote, an athlete we like. We have something that we all share. Um, I firm believe, firm believe in that you have to reach them outside of the playing field. We know why you're here. We know you play football, run track the whole nine. I get that. But for me and you to go to the next level, we gotta go a little deeper. I just always believe that you, you have to, you have to have that. They have to know you care. You know, you know. Again, I tell people all the time, I'm, I'm a high school athletic for a reason. You know, I'm not here to. I, I love it. I'm a teacher. You know, I, I love what I do. If it's about the money, if it's about the next level, then I'd be in college, you know. Um, but for me, this um, this stage of development is very important. You you know, you know, like me, a lot of we lose a lot of kids in high school level. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, you know, we've seen it. I've seen I, I've had a lot of great friends growing up in, um, you know, where we grew up just fall off. Not because they weren't good people. They didn't have anybody to hold their hand through it. Sometimes you need somebody. Sometimes that all day could be men. Sometimes you get somebody to hold your hand through it. It's gonna be all right, you know. And um, I, you know that, and that was one of the defining factors of me teaching. Period. I lost so many friends coming along that I knew they were good people, you know. And um, just the vehicles, just athletics, you know. But I'm a teacher, and I tell everybody I'm a teacher first. And um, you know, I love, I, I love, I'm a, hey, none of my kids say I don't love them. Now I might bite them. 
might bark a little bit. They know I love them to death. I know. Um, I think it was last year. You guys were on a run to the state championship in football. So, and I can kind of, you know, you know, correlate football with uh, with track because a lot of people don't know back when we were going to school, if you played football, you had to run track. Period. I don't care who you was, lineman, whatever, you had to run track. Right. So that that's just the way it went. And I know y'all won a state championship run and you lost one of your players. How tough was that for the for not just the the team, which would include football and track, but for that whole school and that community, man. That's very difficult. You know, um when you're trying to <laughs> first off, let me let me say something about Drew. Drew was, was a good kid, infectious attitude on the very first day. Um he showed up. Um it had been down, it'd been chilling for during the spring. And it was summertime. He came in and he, he was lifting and, I, and one of the first workouts, he threw up. He was like, say, man, y'all getting it, <laughs> getting it here. I say, man, welcome home. And all he did was pick that plate up and keep going. Like he ain't quit. There was no quit in him. Um, and I remember everybody looking at him like, all right, yeah, he's he gonna be fine then. Well, no quit. You know, you know how they go. You know how it go when you, when you meet new people and you kind of find it. Let me let me see where's let me see where's hard at, you know. And 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 his first little test, he passed a fine color. So after that, a lot of kids kind of gravitated to him and say, "Ah, right, he got some, he got some." Um, but just going through that whole process was difficult, you know, because at first off, we people we we human we human first, you know. Yeah, I know the athletics is 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 something that we love, man, and we rock with it. So with the song, but we lost we lost a kid, you know. We lost a kid, very good kid, and um, it was very difficult trying to um, <laughs> trying to go back and forth, man, between athletics and just the human nature of things, you know, because you have some kids that are really strong behind that, you know, um, and it, it's hard. It's hard to be like, hey, man, let's get back up and get ready to play some ball, but the, the, the motivating factor there was, and let's do it for Drew. You know, after that, it was easy. You know, our, our, our whole administration, um, did a wonderful job of handling that. You know, they could have been. Um, they gave us. They gave. They gave us. They gave us a little time to mourn. You know, they could have been hard on us and hey man, you know this happens, but this is. But I, um, I applaud. I applaud administration for being um, hands on like they were, um, and understanding. Um, and it, it just it's the kids too. You know, they uh, they picked up where he left off and. Um, they did a pretty good job um, on the rest of the season, but just um, what he stood for, you know, we ain't quit. You know, we ain't fight. We, I know as a coaching staff, we see our kids. We know our kids are getting tired. You know, it was emotionally they were spent. You know, it's, it's hard enough playing games against um, people. And you know, you know how I go when you get in that third, fourth, fifth round. It's different football right there. And uh, you know, I, I say this, coach, especially mm -hmm. see this thing I tell coaches. You know the 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 fifth, the fourth and fifth round, and even game sixteen. Mm -hmm. If you've never been there, you don't understand different baby. what it takes to get there. Yeah. And then when they'll come to one of your workouts in the summer and see how you work in these boys, man, dude, that's what it takes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you gonna hard work beat talent when talent don't work hard. Yeah. That's all yeah. it boils down to. And in the, in the state of Texas, and track is starting to be a hotbed, just like basketball and football. Mm -hmm. I mean, dude, you're going to have to leave it on the floor. You, you got to. Because when you get outside the city of Houston, it get real. It get one, real say those one-horse towns, you got to remember, you're the disadvantage. You know, you playing a team that's one-horse town, you got everybody in, the, everybody in the city go to one high school, and they've been doing the same thing since they've been in the third grade. Exactly. It's hard. It's our idea. It's our idea, especially because you know we have our time restrictions, and so with us on, and you know our kids, we have different things. You know, hey, maybe we got to go to work. You know, you might have a situation where it's just him and his grandma and his two other siblings. You know, so it's a different thing. You know, like I tell people, we have to, as coaches, especially where we at, um, man, you have to do a, a a good job of managing your kids. You know, sometimes I tell a lot of time I talk to coaches about this. We we love to coach the sport you got to coach the kid you got to coach the kid it's different you know we have you know, I understand sometimes things have to be black and white but our babies some of our babies are a little different some of our babies got different situations 
And you have to understand that and you got to be able to adjust. And I think as a coaching staff, I think we did a pretty good job of that. Um, you know, we have our moments because you always want to, you know, you want things to be black and white and you want things to flow how you want them to flow. But, you know, you're dealing with kids here, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's, it's bad enough with adults. You can't even get adults to do some things sometimes. So especially when you come out some kids, you know, like I tell my kids all the time, I say, man, it's, 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 a, it's a very hard deal being a young black man. We expect you to make grown man decisions at 16. I tell my kids all the time, I say, man, you know, you're 16, but you're setting up your 30-year-old self. I said, the things you're doing right now is going to affect, you know, 30-year-old grade. Go to school, baby boy. Put yourself in a position, go to college. Finish school. 30-year-old Greg, I appreciate that. I know right now you don't understand it because you're 16 and I'm asking you to move like a grown man. But please feel me. Trust me. I tell my time, just trust me through it because you're setting yourself for your future. One day you're going to have a, a lady on your arm. You're going to have some kids. She's going to think you're cute. You're going to lay down and have some kids. And you have to be able to take care of them. You know, and, and nobody gonna understand those excuses. We don't, as a man, we can't do excuses. You know, so let's um let's stop that now. We you know we, we started early when they come to the door. You know, we no excuses. That we, we can't do it as as men. We can't do it. I can't allow you. I can't allow you to lay on that and find solace in that. You know, the excuses out the window. So um you know and like you know Moro, at this job is different. Like I tell people, if you think you're just gonna come to Marshall and coach sports then it's not the place for you you gotta be you gotta coach kids you gotta coach kids you're gonna be there you're gonna be there real early you're gonna be there real late i mean you have to feed some kids i mean it just is what it is if that ain't what you want to do then you gotta go somewhere else you know so because i know I, I i i take my hat off to my coaches man we are we really about them kids you know we really are yeah. um good group of men good group of men man we about those kids and making sure that they um you know, it makes the next level. Like I said, all our kids, man, all y'all not going to play sports at the next level, and that's okay. It's okay. All I did, all we hope is we gave you uh, a palette, uh, set, the, uh, set the expectation of being a man. You know, you're going to work hard and um, and try your best to be a good uh, pillar of the community. Ms. Demetri? So you kind of touched upon my next question a little bit. Um, I read where uh, students actually uh, consider you to be a father figure. For one, did you know that? And how, because you kind of talked about it a little bit, but how important um, is that for you to be seen as a father figure? Um, you know, I don't think I'm going to it saying that, you know, um, because, you know, these, some of these young men, they have fathers, whether they're around or not. So I never want to disrespect the role of their father. Um, I think more than anything else, um, for those young men whose father not around, I try my best to, to model the behavior. You know, I'm, I'm far from being perfect, you know, but I've always believed in your, um, your kids take on the personality of their head coach. And I like to believe that if they see me working hard, they see me being diligent, they see me making sure that um, it's about business first, um, that they that's something that they can hold on to and, um, and use in to in further in life. Um, I, can, I can't help it. You know, I love them. You have different cultures. Everybody have different culture styles. Um, I'm just me. I'm just one of those hands on. And that's just, I don't know the way to do it. I got to have my hands on you, you know. Um, that's just how I came up, you know. That's how it was for me when I was at Yates. You know, they cared about us. And then I had coaches that, you know, they, you know, they, they knew, <laughs> they knew our situations, you know. They knew they they got they got all they got all the paperwork, you know. They know where we stay, who we with. A lot of times, who your daddy was, who your uncle and all. So they they know what's up. And um, I just I, I think I think without without saying anything, I just kind of you know that's that's what I that's what I saw growing up. So you know I tweak a couple of things here and there. Um, I've always believed as a coach, I coach kids the way I wanted to be coached, and I've always wanted I've always thought it was very important to. Um, I mean, you ask kids how they doing, what's going on, you know, outside of the, you know, of the world of athletics. It's important because, again, you know, like you talked about, if we can't, if, you, if they got some real physiological things going on home, then being worrying about catching the ball or, or running in this 200, that's the furthest thing from their mind that they ain't eight today, you know. So um, you got to get in there with them. And I love them. You know, I love them to death. That's just, you know, I'll give them a shirt on my back. You know, that's just – how I am, and everybody's different, and I will never knock anybody for how they do it. That's just me. I'm, 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 you know, 
give them shoes, give them shirts, it don't matter. Just as long as you're good, I'm good. So speaking of getting it in there with them, do you actually run with them sometimes? Well, I used to. The older <laughs> I've got, the older I've got, the further away from the track I've got. <laughs> when I was when I first started with with uh, Batista, with um, Monroe's nephew Batista, I used to run with him. You know, I had a few of them, uh, and I get out there and run with them with a song. Now I get in the weight room with them, throw some weights up, whatever. But I'm the running man. I kind of backed away from the running a little bit. They they out there killing me because I was as a coach. If you when you decide to, when you decide to step in that arena with them, you could be the you could be the slowest kid in the building. If you get on that track, they gonna give you one hundred. They gonna try to mash you. So <laughs> so uh, I love it. I love it. We compete on some things, but now when it comes to the track, man, some kids like I tell them, if 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 you beat me, I'm beating you. We got a problem. So, but uh, now nah, I, I love we have we have fun. We do compete in some things, but I let them have it on the track. Well, I, I tell you, man, I, I I never got a chance to tell you, and y'all so y'all know. He j- Lloyd Banks was a track coach over at Yates, my old high school, my nephew. Um, and I would import him all the way from Siena to come over to Yates because that's where I wanted him to go to school. And he played football, and he thought he was all world in football. And I told him, make sure you run track. He had ran, you know, with the track clubs. But when it was time to go to college, Lloyd Banks got him to college on a full ride. I think that year Jalen graduated with the most scholarship money mm-hmm. um, to the University of Texas Arlington on a full ride. And all it all it really took to get that going was me telling his mama, no, this is the school I want him to go to in high school. This is where I want him to go. I need him around these guys. I need him around these types of coaches, man, because I knew that Coach Banks and 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 all those folks that were there had a lot of old school in them, and, and I needed him around that type of discipline because Lloyd Banks doesn't just coach football and coach track. He's teaching these young men how to be men. And all he's doing is using the game of football and track as an attribute to pull it off. So I, I thank you, man, uh, for, for getting him to school. He went to school, graduated with his degree four years for free. And, th- and that's what I told him. Just use athletics to get your degree. Yeah, please. So, man, what's the difference? And this is my last question for you, coach, and I'll let Demetri close it out. What's the difference between today's athlete and athletes like when we were in school? Man, I get you. Um, man, one thing is access. You know, we had to be, you know, the, <laughs> we didn't have these camps. You know, we didn't have social media. Um, we didn't have all that. Today's athlete, and I'm going to be honest with you, across the board, they're more talented. They're not as tough as we were. And I think a lot of that is, is due just to how we grew up. Um, there's a sense of entitlement, which kind of kind of bugs me out a little bit, you know. Um, but a- athletically, as a whole, not individually, because I see some cold cats, as a whole, um, I mean, they're bigger, stronger, faster as a whole. And I think that's just, I think that's just human nature, you know. But um, the toughness, the toughness level is a lot. It, it's, it's a lot different. You know, we will go. You know, we'll spend ninety minutes. We'll spend ninety, 90 minutes just tackling each other. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it wouldn't bother. It wouldn't. It wouldn't bother the soul. It wouldn't. We, we'll go a whole two hours not drinking on water. I'm not saying it was smart, but I'm just saying this is how we came up. You know, we was bred different. You know, we just were. You know, we ain't have probably walking nowhere. You know, I, I stayed, you know, I stayed no regular arms. So every day, I off the bio, I'm walking the bio, walk all the way around, walk back. That little money, that little five dollars mama gave me on, on mama gave me five dollars Sunday night. You, know, you think I was putting that on the I ain't putting nothing on the bus. That's going in my pocket. I'm walking everywhere. And that's just different. You know, I hear kids now get out, get finished for practice, they get on their phone, call mama, come pick me up. I'm like, what? You sat on the street. Wow. Oh no, I ain't walking nowhere. I ain't doing no walking. <laughs> so that's just, I mean, it's a little different. Like I can say this is a sense of entitlement, um, a little spoiled, but um, you know, 
but they are talented. You just got to hold a hand. It's a little different. Um, that's about it. So I guess if I have the last question, I'll ask you this. In your opinion, who is the greatest track and field athlete of all time? All time. Um, I would say the best track and field sprinter. Let me, let me break it. Let me, let me give you two. I'm, I'm going to give two different sections, two different answers. I think the greatest, the greatest sprinter of all time um, is just Usain Bolt, period. I think the best track and field athlete of all time was Carl Lewis. You know, Carl was also a jumper, um, and he did a lot for the sport. You know, I think that those two individuals, if you mention those names, they'll most people automatically know exactly what you're talking about. And whenever you can, I've always been one of those people, if you can tell, if you can tell the story of track and field um, without an individual, then they weren't that important. You can't tell, you can't tell the story of track and field without saying Carl Lewis or you saying both, period. Those will be the first two people you'll hear. You can't, you can't, you can't tell that story without them. So again, I said that out. I would again, the greatest sprinter of all time, Usain Bolt. The greatest track and field athlete of all time, I give to Carl Lewis. Period. You know, um, again, of both those two individuals have done a lot for the sport. I got, I got, I laugh about it. I said, man, you know, Jamaica's a small country, but yet and still, every year they putting out super track and field athletes and. I mean, for that small country to do what they do on a, on a, on an international scale, not nationally, on an international scale, is a beautiful thing. I can my hats go off. I had to always go off to them. You know, they don't. You know, it's a poor country. You know, they don't have all the resources we have over in the states, but they still get it done. You know, um, my kids laugh at me because I took I t- kind of take um, some of the some of the things that they do in the training. You know, we stay in the grass a long time over at Marshall. They be like, man, why are you in the trash? Why are you on the, why are you on the grass? Let's get on the track. Look. I'm watching Jamaicans do it. It looked like it worked. I'm seeing some success. We're going to use the same thing. So, um, yeah, hats off to those two individuals. I tell you what, Coach, we're going to end it with this here. One, I want to applaud you and all those coaches, all those hardworking teachers at Marshall High School. Marshall has a lot of similarities with the way that they're treated or by a lot of people like Yates has. I mean, at the end of the day, we, we're kind of connected to each other. We are. You know, because some days it's like nobody cared about us. Nobody believed in us. And we had to put the hood on our back. And that's the one thing I like about whether it's football, uh, boys track, girls track. It's like y'all put the hood on your back. We're going to do it for the hood, man. And, and, and that's what it is. And the hood love your back. So I applaud you, Doc for everything that you've done for those children, you and all those coaches, man, giving that whole community an identity and um, just keep up the good work, my friend. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can get to the field this year. Most and, uh, I know we, we didn't face realignment in UIL this year. So I know some people in gauntlet districts, but <laughs> I never kind of worry about it with Marshall football because the one thing they're going to do is play football yeah. on a Friday night. You're going to have a hard hat over there playing with them boys. So, man, thank you. Thank you and all those coaches all right. for what you do for those children every single day, brother. Thank okay. you so much. Okay. Miss K, thank you. I appreciate you for having me. Uh, anytime, anytime, anything you need, man, you know, you can call on me. I got you. All right, my brother. All right. All love and say I have a good one. All right. Yeah, man, if y'all just tuning in, that's a bad boy right there, man. Four state championships in five years. Ranked number one in the country before the pandemic come through. The only thing could run them out the stadium was the coronavirus. <laughs> that was it. Now, I know y'all done tuned in because y'all want some fireworks. Well, we're going to give it to you. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to give it to Demetri. You can start it up because I know they waiting. Some people waiting, man. I wish I would have made me a glass of vodka before I get <laughs> the topic in the country right now. I'm going to tell y'all what. I don't drink much, but tonight I got like a, a, a bottle of champagne back there. <laughs> I might crack it open. Um, just in the last couple of days, the conversations that we've been having, if, you know, specifically in regards to Joe Biden, has just been mind-blowing. I mean, even as... Um, this unfolds and what is this 
Uh, the fact that he said, if you don't know who you're voting for, if you if you haven't decided who you're going to vote for between him and Trump, um, you ain't black. The conversation is still raging on, especially on uh, social media. And again, uh, as we talked about last time, or a couple hours ago, rather, it's just mind blowing that people, I call it uh, nagger explaining, you know, play on the other words. You know, we got, we got people who are trying to explain what Joe Biden meant or what he you know, they thought he said, even his campaign um, advisors are trying to walk it back a little bit and say, oh, it was just, it, it wasn't just, he was playing around. Then he apologized saying, oh, you know, I could have been trying to be a wise guy, but anybody who has followed the career of Joe Biden knows that he does a lot of gaps, which are um, goof. Um, some people would liken it to a Freudian slip of the tongue where, um, like consciously, well, consciously, you didn't mean to say it, but subconsciously you did. And so it kind of just comes out, right? Uh, that's just kind of been um, his thing. But I, like I said, I'm just stuck at people trying to explain it away. What he, I mean, he said what he said. I don't understand, you know, where the confusion is. Well, first of all, Brenda says she was looking for Donovan. And we've been going at it all day on this thing. We might need to check on Donovan. To make sure one of them Biden supporters ain't snatched him up, or he ain't drunk. <laughs> yeah, somewhere. But we gonna we'll find out. Uh, I kind of feel like you. I feel like I see a lot of black folk making excuses for him, uh, trying to act like he didn't mean it. He was joking. How the hell you know what Biden was thinking? You don't know, but you're gonna try to make every excuse. I mean, me and you have been getting. You know, we've been on threads today. You know, folk upset. And, and I'm talking about black folk that I know, you know, trying to tell me why I need to vote for him. No, you can't tell me to vote for him. If you don't have a problem with that old ass white man disrespecting you, then that's your business. I got a problem with it. So, you know, I really think, honestly, whatever shot he thought he had at the presidency, I think that it went down the drain today. I, I just think that it, he, I don't think. Unless he can get um, Michelle Obama, I don't think he got a shot in hell of beating Trump at all. Whatever percentages he had before he woke up this morning, he no longer has those. I, I don't think he, that he has it. And I mean, he can try to explain it away, but words are like bullets. Once you shoot them, you can't take them back. So you, you can't take it back. You can't walk this down. You can't. You can't clean that up. Maybe if he'd have listened to his staffer and got off that interview when he told him, he would not have said what he said. But he exposed himself for who he truly was. And now we need to treat him accordingly. Yeah. yeah. Once he got off the interview, I know his kid is just going crazy. I know we got a little bit of feedback. Um, something. Yeah, my, my phone is down. Um, but yeah, I know he got a lot of heat from his team because, you know, I'm in public relations. And so you do have handlers, especially when you're uh, running for the president of the United States. You have handlers. You have people you have to listen to. And I, I know the whole time that he was speaking, they were just biting their nails like, when is the other shoe going to drop? When is he going to say something that's going to potentially cost us maybe the, um, the campaign or the election? Um, and sure enough, he, he didn't disappoint. But, you know, they're saying, too, that he's actually falling behind with black voters. He's only trending within the 80 percentile um, of, for black voters. And normally for a Democratic uh, co candidate, it's in the 90s. And so I would uh, say after today, I think uh, uh, definitely a lot of people are going to start thinking about, OK, like we've been in denial about a whole bunch of stuff up until this point. But we really can't deny you know, what he said. I mean, it's just like, I, most people I know don't like to be pandered to. And that's what he did. I mean, that was just a complete, like if you look in a dictionary under pandering, you would have saw a picture of Joe Biden. Okay, he was paid through in the NAACP. He threw in, if you ain't, you, you ain't black, if you don't vote for him. And, you know, oh, I didn't really do this, that, and the other. And the crime bill wasn't really this. It was a drug bill. And the, the uh, Congressional Black Caucus actually asked him to do it, which I did read. That is true. But even still, he was making the decisions. 
And not only just that one time, but in 82, 80, I think 84, 86, 88, um, and 94. So we continuously, you know, drew up these uh, crime bills that disproportionately hurt black people in black communities. And we are still suffering the effects of it to this moment. And so for him to say, oh, well, I was just being a wise guy. Is like, are you joking with us? Does the black community look like we need somebody to be joking when it comes to the things that go on in our community? And why would you think any of that is funny? I mean, honestly. Here's my thing. Chris Ray. I saw that. Um, well, Corita Cheeks, I respect you guys for keeping or even tuning black voters in to Biden. What, for what he's done and what he hasn't done. But what's the alternative? Can you just give the viewers an alternative? And then Chris said he made a mistake. When you are racist, when you are racist, you don't make mistakes. You make comfortable statements. You made a statement that you were comfortable making. Now, if you guys need to put some fluff on that, then it's cool. But I know if he was in the regular world, working a regular job, you would be after him right now. You would be trying to make him lose his job. You see what I'm saying? Now, as far as the, the comment, can you give us an alternative? Just like Tara said earlier, you have more options than Biden and and Trump. But the thing is, we don't want to see past Biden. You have other options. You definitely do. So, you know, if you believe he made a mistake, that's your business. I've worked around races for 12 years. He ain't make no mistake. I guess I'm trying to figure out how that a mistake. A mistake is you accidentally tripping over something. That's a oops. You know, but a mistake? I mean, he couldn't, he, it's like he could have just not said anything, but he threw that in almost like, you know, let me just throw everything in there to get them to vote for me. You know, I'm going to accuse them of not, but that's not a mistake. He knew what he was doing. They are professional panderers. That's what they do. They pander to the black community. And they say and do anything because they know nine times out of 10, we're going to eat it up. Oh, you know, Joe Biden said, I ain't black if I don't go for him. And he know I'm black. So I, I mean, a mistake. That's what I call nag explaining. You're trying to explain away some bull caca. Joe Biden don't need you to explain that the way he's a big boy. He, he pays people probably hundreds of thousands of dollars to do that job. He doesn't need you to do that. He said what he said. Corita Cheeks, I know why you're asking me that. Can you explain the options? I know every option. Write them in. You can write Louis Farrakhan. Why don't you write your name in there? But you definitely don't have to vote for that sucker. You don't. And that's, I don't care who you who y'all vote for. I'm going to say y'all. I don't care. You're not going to beat him. When you have a fool making these kind of comments and you running against a machine, you're not going to beat him. It's just not going to happen. So I need you to prepare for another four years of this reality show. You need to prepare for another four years of this reality show. Now, Chris Ray say, what about the black Democrats we've been voting for for 40 years who've been giving us the same speeches for years? You want to speak on that one? Because we talk about that all the time. So now we, we actually agree. I don't know what that is. It sounds like a, a monster. Um, Hold on, let me mute my microphone. <laughs> so now we, much better. So now we, we actually agree. We're coming to a consensus here. You're exactly right. Why? keep voting for the same people who keep telling us the same lies, who keep giving us the same speeches. And so to Carita, you um, wanna know what the alternative is. The alternative is to force their hand. If you want our vote, 
then you need to give us something for our vote. We don't want any more speeches and you know none of that. We want something tangible, something to say, oh, this is so nice and shiny, it's beautiful. Look what I got for my vote. Whether it's reparations, whether it's better education, whether it's better housing, whether it's some land, whether it's freedom, justice, and equality. We want something we can say it was worth the blood that our ancestors spilled during the civil rights movement in order for us to get here. We want something we can actually sink our teeth into. So I agree with you. What about the black Democrats? They're the worst. But I always say too, why do we keep voting for them? Because they give us a nice sound bite. I'm reclaiming my time. I mean, you know how many people have ran away with that? With Auntie Maxine Waters, I'm reclaiming my time. People went to the booth simply because she was reclaiming her time and she was talking, and that's, I'm gonna reiterate this, she was talking tough to Trump. But to this day, she hasn't held Trump accountable at all. She isn't she the head of the finance committee? And she's supposed to be doing this and that and nothing for Trump and the two Trump. What has she done? She gave you guys some cute little sound bites. You went and put, put it on t-shirts. You didn't put it on your, your, your cover picture on Facebook. And you didn't ran around talking about, oh, Auntie Maxine claiming her time. She claiming her time. But what has she actually got for you? She got her time, but what did you get? Here's the thing, you hold the power. You hold the power. Because holding your vote gonna make some people tighten up. It's gonna make some folk tighten up. Now, if holding the vote means that you don't vote for Biden, shift that same energy over to Congress. Shift it over to the Senate. Shift it over to the state senators. Shift it over to the state legislators. I guarantee you we get some act right when ain't nobody voting for them. When they start losing their seats, then we will clearly understand that we hold the power. But you got to make them feel it. See, I'm going to tell you what I believe. God will take you through hell to get you to heaven. And if I got to go through hell for four more years to make sure I can get to heaven, then that's going to show them you just don't get my vote like this no more. We played this game enough. This game was being played when I was coming out of my mom's womb. I'm 52 years old. This game was being played. I think 52 years is long enough. It's long enough. And if you are comfortable giving your vote to these people and we not get anything in return, then that's the way it's going to be. You can't keep blaming that on Trump. You have to blame it on them people. It is what it is. Now, it ain't, it ain't no prior. Now, let me put your comment up. I agree with holding the vote, but it must be done now prior. I, I, I think hold your vote right now. Everybody felt bamboozled. You, you, you People mad at Puffy. Puffy felt bamboozled because of Obama. He felt he didn't get anything for his vote. And that's a man that has everything. But when your community suffers, enough is enough. We have to stop this. And we can't fix it unless we start holding people accountable. And I'm sorry that it has to be Joe. If Joe cannot come up with a very serious agenda for black people, then there is no need for you to give him your vote. I'm sorry. And that means you're going to have to hold on tight to your faith for four more years because God going to take you through hell to get you to heaven. But I knew it was something I wanted to say to you this morning when we were on the other program that, and I done forgot it again. Go ahead. Just if I've been trying to say it like two or three times and I keep forgetting it. <laughs> 
Well, maybe you're not supposed to say it for some reason. Maybe the universe is like, uh-uh. <laughs> it, ain't, it ain't a rough comment. It's just something that was pertinent. I'm sure to come back to you. <laughs> but I just really think at the end of the day, you know, or we as black people just have to know we deserve more and we deserve better. You know, we have to draw the line in the sand somewhere and say enough. You know, like that corny Jennifer Lopez movie, Enough, when she put on the brass knuckles and she was, you know, kicking her ex-husband's butt. We got, <laughs> we got to get to that point. Enough. Enough of the lies actually put something on the table that we can actually say, hmm, I think that's worth a vote. Let me think about it. But this lift every voice thing, it, it this was just hollow. It was hollow. It was almost like him and Simone Sanders and all the other people on this team was like, let's go with the lift every voice because Negroes just love that song. It just does something to them. It just, oh, let's call it lift every voice. And, you know, let's do some gun control stuff. Well, as we know, gun control, it, yeah, we got a lot of issues with it, but we don't own that issue. That's white folks that actually own the gun issue. Those are the people who are running in and out of the, you know, the malls and the movie, uh, movies and schools, and they're predominantly doing that. So to try to put the gun control issue solely on us, Come on, Joe. You know, we, we've already heard you say that you'd be damned if you are held responsible for something your ancestor did in regards to reparations. He says he's not paying it, but he paid Jews uh, reparations because he says, you know, to the senior citizen Jews, he says, well, I don't think they should die with nothing. I think they should have something. So he did that under the Obama administration and the Obama administration, including Barack Obama, said that. He didn't think um, black people should get reparations. It would be problematic, but they wrote a check to Jews. So I just think it, it comes down to us for one, educating ourselves and feeling like we deserve something. Yeah, I mean, we just do. You know, it's like that almost reminds me of, you know, better I R.I.P. A piece of a man is better than no man at all. A, a, a janky candidate is better than no candidate that's bull. How about you not have no man if your man ain't treating you right? And how about you don't vote for the, a candidate if the candidate is not suiting your knees? It, to me, it's not that hard. We have to make up our minds. When are we just going to say enough is enough from these politicians? Everybody winning except for the voters. Everybody is winning except for the voters. You feel what I'm saying? So, I mean, this this goes back a long time. I said it this morning, decades and decades. You know, we, we worry about voter suppression. Well, maybe there's a reason that we weren't supposed to vote. Because when we come out in droves, we still don't get nothing out the deal. We don't get anything out the deal. And every city in america seems to have the same problems in the african-american neighborhoods we have african-american representation but yet we all have the same problems high crime you know issues with our seniors and, and health care mental health our schools are failing and when you try to have a conversation with these people, the only thing they're going to start talking about if they politicians they're going to tell you about the bills they wrote 20 years ago I don't want to hear. I need to. I got Janet Jackson syndrome. What have you done for me lately? And if Joe ain't did nothing for Mr. Monroe, you're not getting that vote. Not for me, man. I don't care what nobody else do. I can't do it. He has to come up with something. You know, that that shows that you you have done something. See, I can't even give him the benefit of the doubt. You can't tell me what you're going to do. I want to know what you've done. And if you can't tell me what you've done, then I can't cast that vote for that dude. But I can't cast it for him anyway. He's a disrespectful. And, you know, just to be clear, 
I, I'm not casting a vote for Trump either, you know, because I know a lot of times people misconstrue it and say, well, if you're not going to vote for uh, uh, Biden, you must be voting for Trump. I'm not voting for either one of them. Neither one of them are good for black people. Right. And so as uh, Farrakhan says, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, Trump candidacy is going to make uh, the hood great again because it's going to force us to come together, unify and see what we need to do to pull ourselves up, because ultimately it's going to take us to save us. No longer can we can uh, rely on a party, regardless of what party it is, to do for us what we should be doing for ourselves. And so I think, you know, as, as harsh as it's going to sound, it's probably going to take another four years of Trump before black people really just say, hey, you know what? It's been a rough eight years, but at least we're working on getting our stuff together because, you know, Trump will do something here and there for his African-Americans, as he calls us, my African-Americans. But it will it, it won't be um, what we should do for ourselves. And Biden is not even going to he's not even lying to us. He's just like, hey, I'm just going to throw you a bone and see what you guys do with that. And unfortunately, some people are salivating over the bone with no meat on it. This is what I've been trying to say three or four times. I told the wife, remember I was talking about the wife this morning, and we were arguing about Obama. And I say, if he win and he win re-election, I'm going to make you a promise. You're going to have some problems. She said, what you mean? I said, I'll talk to you after the second election. Because I knew he would probably win again. So when his second term was almost up, she said, I'm coming back to you. I want to know what you meant. I say, man, y'all don't even understand the game. I say, now you didn't got, and it, can I say it exactly how I say it? It's not a cuss word, but it incorporates the word nigga. I say, now you didn't had your nigga president for eight years. They finna get it out your ass for the next eight. They gonna make you pay for that. That's exactly what I told her. They gonna make you pay for them eight years, partner. So you got eight and you capping, we gonna make you pay for the next eight. But you can't get mad at them because you're so busy focusing on Trump, you forgot about the Senate and the Congress. That's when you control the country. So you've let them folks slipped through the cracks and now you get 1200 out of stimulus package because your people ain't got no power to get nothing else nothing else you see what i'm saying the pendulum like like tara says the pendulum always swings back it's like throwing a boomerang you threw it that way for eight years not a thing to come back on y'all and they gonna make you feel it no matter if you couldn't pass your laws or whatever you wanted to do, you couldn't appoint your people like you wanted to. They just felt you was capping too much. With your little fly banquets and usher in the White House and, you know, all these folk dancing around. Oh, we finna give it to you now. But guess what? You can't get mad. They control it now. When we control it, we do the same thing. We do the same thing. We we just don't seem to be racist when we do it. Well, and um, Mitch McConnell also said that having a black president was reparations for black people. Like, are, why aren't you satisfied? You had a black president for eight years. That's all we're going to give you. <laughs> so I agree with you. You know, we are going to pay for it, which is why you see a lot of like, don't ever think the racism wasn't always here. It's always been here. It's just, yeah, I would say Trump has been them and giving them, you know, a little rah-rah. But that's why we're seeing so much of it going on now. It's because Obama was in the White House and now they feel like they got, you know, the great white hope in Trump. He's going to, yeah, they say, make America great again. And God knows what that really means. but. At the end of the day, regardless of who's in office, we have to start doing for self like we used to do 
after slavery we were doing for self because nobody else was going to do for us, right? So, I, it, me personally, I can speak for myself, and I, I'm not going to vote for the lesser of two evils. I'm a student of Malcolm X, and Malcolm X I, I, I told us voting for evil is still choose uh, the lesser of two evils is still choosing evil. So, and I, uh, you know, I, I know it's a tough, tough subject. But uh, this is a lot of Christians who have that ideology. Well, I'm going to vote anyway. I'm going to vote for the lesser two evils. God asks you not to be lukewarm. Why are you being lukewarm when it comes to a human? When God tells you not to be lukewarm, because I will spit you out of my mouth like vomit for being lukewarm, but here you are going to choose the lesser of two evils. That's confusion. And I don't go to church, not a religion at all, but I do go to the Bible. And God, and I'm trying to speak to people because most of the time our black Christians are usually Democrats as well. God is not the author of confusion. And voting for the lesser of two evils is confusion. Right? So at the very least, I would just impress upon you guys and everybody, black people, have some dignity, right? It's okay to walk away um, when you don't have any, when there's nothing you want being offered. Just walk away. You, you, you will be fine. We we are the toughest people ever to walk planet Earth. We are so resilient and resourceful. We have overcome a lot of stuff. And trust me, four more years of Trump ain't going to kill us. At the most, it's going to unify us. And I don't think, I think that's an unintended consequence that they, being the MAGA crowd, don't, they don't see that coming. Are black people actually uh, unifying. Whether they want to accept it or not, after today, you finna have four more years. So you can sit around and fight around and act like you got a shot at it in November. Do whatever you want to do. You better be getting your mind right. You know, because we all in this. Me, I can handle it. Ain't, ain't nothing Trump do on a daily basis that bothers me. Nothing. You see what I'm saying? Ain't nothing Trump's do on a daily basis bother Monroe. We don't, that man don't bother me. I, I ain't getting caught up in all that. I mean, it is what it is. So, you know, the way I look at it, if one of them call you in in your face, you 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 hate him, but the one that call you in behind your back, you cool with it? Come on, man. That's a double standard. I tell y'all what, man. We really have to locate Donovan. I'm, 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 I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm going to come right back on at about 8.30 with a watch party. I've been invited to sit on this other panel with a staunch Trump supporter and some Biden supporters. But with the OG sitting in the middle, ain't no telling what I'm going to say. So you might want to watch that. Demetri, give them your final words, sweetie. I would just say continue to um, get informed and educate yourself, even if you don't take our word for it. Go Google. Google Joe Biden, Google Donald Trump, and then Google what we as Black people need to do in order to save ourselves. I'll tell you what, better yet, go, please, if you don't do anything else, go study Marcus Garvey. Study Marcus Garvey, the teachings of Marcus Garvey, because that's where all the people that um, are leaders now and uh, now and, and past, they got their ideology from Marcus Garvey. Please go read upon, go YouTube Marcus Garvey if you haven't already, and then all of this will make more sense to you. But at the end of the day, we have to do for self as Marcus Garvey admonished us. He says, up, unite, mighty nation, accomplish what you will, because we are capable of doing that. Tara said, well, what do you suggest we do in this situation? Well, it's a Friday night and you just got paid. Wake up in the morning. Go to HEB if you got one close. Get you some crawfish, potatoes, corn, and sausages. Boil it up. Get you a big old box. Put you some crawfish on it. And suck the crawfish the same way you run around here sucking Joe Biden.
Better to suck crawfish than somebody that don't know if we black. Suck the crawfish, man. Say, I want to thank our guests. Head track coach Marshall High School, Missouri City, Texas. Coach Lloyd Banks. <laughs> My co-host, Demetri K. We going to locate Donovan. I'm coming back on with a watch party. Y'all don't want to miss this at 8, 8.30, man. Don't 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 get burning no crawfish. He get one that's too hot, he gonna die dead on arrival. Dead on arrival. Suck on them crawfish and stop sucking on Joe. That's what it is, man. I'll let you tomorrow, baby.